Hello, my name is Brady J. Hardy and I am a professional 3D artist working in the games industry. What I'm showing you here is some of my previous work. I have a passion for creating stylized characters and my most recent sculpt of Lewis from the Ogscast received a lot of support on their subreddit. That is a lot of upvotes. Let me just read you a few of the comments that, that I received. It's disgusting. I love it. I really didn't need to envisage Lewis's jaundiced ass cheeks today. My wife. Lewis TTT skin isn't real. It can't hurt you. Lewis TTT skin? I'm repulsed. And a little aroused. Please let this be his new TTT skin. Thanks, I hate it. Please let Lewis see this and use it. This is both disturbing and amazing. Add this to Gmod, please. Love those cheeks. It'd be great if this could be a TTT skin. Just a rig and release to the Yogs. <laughs> now, aside from people telling me that my hard work uh, disgusted them, a, a couple of those comments really stood out to me, namely the ones telling me that I should add this to Gary's Mod, and I've never worked with Gary's Mod before, so how hard could it be? It... It took me 10 days. That, that's how hard it was. It took me 10 days. Now with that introduction out of the way, I would love to formally invite you to join me on this project breakdown of the Oxcast Lewis TTT player model. Now for the sake of this video, I'm gonna break this project down into a couple of steps. That way it's easier to follow and it just flows nicer. I think it's important to say beforehand that the project did not flow this naturally working on it. In fact, it was largely iterative and I bounced between these stages a lot to troubleshoot problems to get the best results. I believe the best place to start this breakdown is to identify the problem that I'm trying to solve. If you're unfamiliar with the acronym TTT, that stands for Trouble in Terrorist Town. Trouble in Terrorist Town is a game mode inside of Gary's Mod, and I'm not going to bother explaining it. The Trouble in Terrorist Town series is one of my favorites, and it's been around for over five years. I killed because you told me that it was a fucking jester. We all believed you. Uh, right, I, I'm okay. going to shoot Lewis in the head. <laughs> this is an omen! Oh A terrible omen! <laughs> Quickly, kill yourself! <laughs> what? What? what you just saw was a quick glimpse into the sort of chaos that you can find in the Yogscast TTT series. What you may have noticed is that the characters they're playing as are from other video games or forms of media, and that is possible due to Gary's mod. The Steam Workshop has tons and tons and tons of characters available for you to play as. And it would make sense that if you had a series that had been going for five years, you would try to monetize it. Obviously, it is not very smart to try and monetize characters that you do not own the rights to, which leads the Yogs cast to use the term legally distinct when describing their characters. I think the merch line of Season 3 had really strong designs of their characters. These were basically caricatures of their characters meshed with either their personal appearance or other things like that. The Season 3 poster is actually the first piece of Yogs cast merchandise that I've bought. As you can tell, it is not hanging on my wall yet. That, that is something I need to do. Uh, maybe by the next video I will have that done. So with these fantastic designs as a 3D artist, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if these were the characters they were playing as? In a way, I suppose that's sort of my goal with this, is to create legally distinct characters for the Oxcast to use. That way, if they're trying to create merchandise, they're not looking for ways to get around legal issues. Also, for being a fan for almost a decade, it would be really cool to say my work was used in one of their series. With all of that finally said, I think it's time we jump into the next stage. Sculpting.
When I create a stylized character, I always start with the head. It's a lot easier for me to see the final character when I have a head that looks good. Lewis's head actually came out pretty quickly. Sometimes I have to really fight with the design to get the head to a point where I feel like I can actually do the character justice in 3D. Once I established a head I enjoyed, I blocked out the body. Blocking out is a super important part of the modeling process and most people would actually block out the head and the body at the same time, but I'm an idiot, so I don't do that. The block out phase is super important for building a strong foundation for your character out of primitive shapes. That way you have strong primary forms moving into the detailing phase. When I started this sculpt, the main goal was to practice in areas I'm not super comfortable in, like sculpting clothing folds and hair. It doesn't mean I haven't sculpted these things before, it just means I tend to stay inside a comfort zone with them. With clothing, for instance, I try to avoid making clothing folds because they terrify me. However, with this character, I wanted to make sure I got some clothing folds in to help sell the tightness of the material around Lewis's body. Hair is actually something that's really fun to do because ZBrush has these amazing curve brushes and people have made tons of hair brushes online that use this function. So all I have to do is draw a curve and it will make a hair strand for me so I could sculpt these glorious strands of hair. If you're wondering why I'm sculpting the entire body when the final character won't even see the body, there's a couple reasons. In ZBrush it's super easy to make clothing off of a body using masking. It's also great practice sculpting anatomy, so I like to sculpt bodies regardless. And also now going forward, I have a nude body of Lewis that I can build more clothing off of if I ever want to update the model with more clothing options. One thing I really like to do when I'm working on a character is to use ZBrush's poly paint, which allows you to paint onto your model. I always feel that being able to see the character in color helps me see where I want the design to go to reach the final product that I want. Finally, once I was happy with all the detailing, I got him posed and sent him to Marmoset Toolbag 3 where I rendered him out. I then took my renders, put them into Photoshop, and created the composition that I posted to Reddit. By this point, it was probably around 3am, so I went to bed. The next morning I woke up and the post had 600 upvotes and a ton of comments for me to reply to. Needless to say, the support was overwhelming, and I quickly got to work on turning him into a Gary's Mod player model. And with that, we are done the sculpting phase, and we can move on to retopology. Retopology is the process of taking a high poly model and turning it into a low poly model manually. High poly and low poly are in reference to the polygon count that your model has. Since games run in real time, unlike movies, you want your models to have a lower polygon count. There's a lot of software you can use for retopology. Personally, I use 3D Coat because it has some really cool tools that I like to utilize in my workflow. When I first started retopologizing Lewis, I dove headfirst into it without much thought. This turned out to be a mistake because as I started to think about what I wanted out of this model, I realized my approach was going to cause me problems, so I had to restart. What I was doing is I was hard modeling the clothing and body together. This made it so if I ever make more clothing for this character, I would have to completely redo the topology since the clothing was attached to the head and I couldn't just remove the current clothing and replace it with something new. When doing topology, you want to have a basic understanding of edge flow. If you don't have a good edge flow, that can lead to some nasty deformations when your character is actually in motion. Thinking ahead and knowing how you're going to rig this character can help a lot too. However, I did not do that because I did not know how rigging for Gmod worked at the time. Going forward, I'll be able to make a much better retopology on characters now knowing how the process works. I tried to cut some corners on the hair. This turned out to be something that bit me in the ass and I had to come back and do it. When I created the hair inside of ZBrush, all the hair was separated into separate strands. I then used something called Dynamesh and merged them all together. I then used a function called ZRemesher which automatically lowers the polygon count of the model. At the time, I thought having the hair as one solid chunk would be the best approach, so this is what I thought would be the easiest way to do that. 
when I got to the next stage of development, I realized what a mistake I had made and had to come back and redo the hair completely. This time, I kept all the hair separate and I retopologized every single strand individually. Because of the amount of work I had to do with the hair as individual pieces, I can tell you with certainty that there are 16 different models that make up his hair. Fortunately for me, 3D Coat has a stroke tool for retopology that allows you to draw strokes to create a base retopology to clean up afterwards. This made retopologizing the hair an absolute breeze. With my new low poly model now complete, I could now move on to the next step, creating our UVs. It may be a good place to start by explaining what UVs are. UVs are what you use to put a texture on a 3D object. Creating UVs, you are essentially unfolding your 3D model into a 2D plane. For example, this paper tube I have folded would be my 3D object, while this unfolded piece of paper would be what its UVs would look like. Obviously, a character is a little more complex than a cube tube, which is why using programs like 3D Coat really helps speed up the process. The first thing I'm going to do is separate my character into UV sets by what parts of the character I want on the same texture map. I chose to put the body all together. I then put all of the hair objects together. I put the eyes and teeth together since they would have a similar specular material. And finally, the clothes were all together. The next part of the process was to mark my UV seams. The seams tell the program where you want the edges of the UV groups to be. Then you can run an unwrap function and the software will unwrap your model into its UVs. Now this is actually the second character I have made UVs for. The first one was in 2018 while I was in college. Since I use ZBrush's poly paint feature, that actually operates on something called vertex color, which assigns a color value to every vertice on your mesh. So instead of mapping each vertice to a texture, it instead interpolates between the colors to create a smooth transition. I learned a lot making the UVs for the Lewis character, and now going forward I know what to do and what to avoid. I could have saved myself a lot of time by making edges that I intended to be UV seams when I was making my retopology. At this point you're probably wondering, is this guy actually a professional? And to be honest with you, after almost a decade of doing 3D art, I'm asking the same question. On the final player model, there are some noticeable UV seams. And now that I have shown them to you, you are not going to be able to unsee them, you're welcome. As a perfectionist, it kills me to leave these in the release of the player model, but I cannot justify the amount of time it would take to go back and fix them. I also cannot justify the amount of time it would take for me to explain everything I would have to do to fix them. It's a mess, I'm sorry. <laughs> However, now with the UV seams done, we are done in 3D Coat and can jump back into Marmoset Toolbag to do the next step, baking our textures. If you were expecting me to bake you some cookies, I'm sorry, that is not what I'm going to be doing. Instead, texture baking is the process of transferring details from one model to another. What I'll be doing is taking details from the high poly sculpt and transferring those onto our low poly character. Thanks to Marmoset Toolbag 3, that process is actually super easy. First things first, we're going to create our bakers. For this character, we will need four of them. One for the hair, one for the clothes, one for the body, and one for the eyes and teeth. Now I need to import my high poly sculpt and my low poly character and sort the objects into their appropriate baker. Now before we press the bake button, we have to tell Marmoset Toolbag what maps we want. At this point, I didn't know what maps I would need for Gary's mod, so I actually exported more just to be safe. The three types of maps I actually ended up using were an albedo map, an AO map, and a bump map. An albedo map takes all of the color value, but does not keep shadows or highlights, which is perfect for my vertex color. I then used a AO map to get all of the shadows, that way I could overlay it in Photoshop to control how strong the shadows were. Finally, I used the bump map to preserve all of the details I didn't hard model into the low poly character. And now our low poly character looks just as good as our high poly character. In fact, if you don't know where to look, you'd probably think they were the same model. Here they are side by side.
Now I'm going to show you the wireframes and as you can see our lower poly character has a significantly less poly count. Our high poly sculpt had 2,081,672 polygons while our low poly character had 14,748 polygons. That is an astounding 99.29% decrease in polygons. It was at this stage in development when I had to go back and redo the retopology for the hair. Baking the hair is one big chunk caused problems with the cage, and I haven't explained what a cage is yet, so let me do that. A cage is essentially something that sets the boundaries for the bake. On the beard, for example, the high poly sculpt was poking through the cage, so I had to expand the cage of the low poly model, that way it was properly baking all the details. With the baking complete, we are finally done in Marmoset Toolbag, and we can jump to Autodesk Maya for the next stage. Rigging. The first step for making a player model for Gary's Mod requires you to have a skeleton from a default valve biped. This is the skeleton that all the Gary's Mod animations are built on. Rigging a character is somewhat straightforward. You need to bind your mesh to the actual skeleton. Then from there, you need to paint your skin weights. Skin weights determine how much influence a joint has over a certain vertice. In the footage you're seeing, my skin weights are running on a gradient. White and red colors mean that there is more influence, and black and blue means there is less. Considering how often I rig a character, which is almost never, I was really happy with how quickly I got Lewis rigged. And I quickly jumped into getting him ported into Gary's Mod. And if you're clever, you just noticed that there was not a subtitle for porting. That is because things did not go well after this point. As I was getting ready to export him for compiling, which I will explain in the next step, I ran into a major issue. The tool I was using to work with Val file types with Maya is a piece of garbage and barely worked at all. Then I decided I would just export it into Blender and export it as the proper file type from there. So I installed Blender and that's when I found out that a rigged character does not transfer skin weights to Blender from Autodesk Maya. The only other tool I have seen mentioned was 3ds Max, another piece of Autodesk software. At this point, I was unwilling to reskin this entire character, which I just spent a few days working on, so I bought a subscription. After spending a absolutely delicious 362 Canadian dollars, I now had 3ds Max and I could transfer my files from Maya to Max to the proper file types. So for everyone keeping track, make sure to write down that this model has now cost me $362 and 10 days of my life. When I finally got Lewis to compile properly, I ran into another problem. When I rigged the character, I moved the bones to match the character size. However, once you move him into Gary's mod, those bones snap back to their original proportions and now the model looks like absolute garbage. I knew, because I've watched the Augs cast series, that Zoe's player model is small. That must mean there is some way for me to maintain the proportions of my character, I just didn't know how yet. Luckily for me, the community managed to archive the Face Punch forums which were shut down in 2018. I found a thread from the person who discovered something called the proportions trick and quickly tried to figure out how this worked. I'll save you some of the details, but essentially it didn't go well and I almost gave up on this project. I genuinely hoped everyone in the Reddit thread who gave me such kind support would forget about it and I would never have to worry about it again. However, I knew I couldn't just give up because people were so kind to me and gave me so much support and I wasn't going to let those people down. Not that I think people would be let... Uh, not Like, if a stranger didn't finish something, you'd be let down, I, I don't think... You know what I mean? I, For myself, I knew I had to finish this. I'm not someone who likes asking for help, but I had to this time. I found the person who created that original proportions trick thread on Steam and I sent them a friend request. The next day they provided me with such invaluable help that ultimately saved the project. So Captain Big Butt, thank you. They were kind enough to provide me with vanilla Valve assets. You probably wouldn't believe me when I told you I could not find a single resource telling me how to get these vanilla assets myself. So what I had been doing was I was ripping add-ons from the Steam Workshop in hopes that their skeletons would do the job. So with these new vanilla assets I got back into rigging. I think it's important to mention that there are a few unique types of bones on this character. There are procedural bones, also known as helper bones, and jiggle bones. 
The helper bones help the mesh deform properly. It took me quite a while to get these helper bones to function. I was using a ulna bone and a wrist bone to help the wrist from squashing when the hand is turned. However, I had to get rid of the skinning on the wrist bone and just use the ulna bone to get something I was happy with. The jiggle bones run on physics and that is how I created Lewis's hair. I also had to create a unique rig for the first person arms, but it worked a little bit differently. The basic idea of the proportions trick is that it subtracts your new proportions from the default skeleton and adds those values onto the animation so that you can have your unique proportions. You cannot do this with the first person arms however, so I actually had to manipulate the mesh to fit the skeleton. So here is what the first person arms look like compared to the third person character. I'd love to say things work perfectly at this point, but that's just not true. At this point, the iteration started to happen and I would go between this stage and the next and I would port what I had into Gary's mod and I would see how it worked and then I'd go back to rigging and change it. And that's just not something I'm going to go back and forth on in this video. So for the sake of this video, I'm going to say everything worked perfectly and just start breaking down the next stage, porting it into Gary's mod. Porting my model into Gary's mod was a very satisfying process. I was unaware that there was this much coding involved. That's not a bad thing, I actually really enjoyed learning how QC files work. Essentially your QC file is going to combine a bunch of reference files together to create your final asset. So I ended up separating the body, the clothes, and the hair onto separate rigs and combine them all in the compile. This allows me to use body groups, which means I can create new hairstyles and clothing options and make them toggleable in Gary's mod with a slider. For now, the only option you have is to remove his hair, and uh, I don't recommend doing that. At this stage, I also had to create my materials. I had to turn every texture into a VTF and then assign those to a VMT. This then allows us to change the color of the hair and clothes by giving the VMT the option to have color changing. We also have to create our physics model. This is a bunch of invisible primitive shapes that surround your character, that way it knows how to collide properly when it's ragdolled. I also had to create custom hitboxes for this character. Hitboxes determine where and how the bullets hit the character. It's important that they're accurate so the opponents don't feel like they're at a disadvantage because of your character model. I also had to create some physics constraints. There was a problem where the head was over-rotating in one of its axes and it looked terrible when he was ragdolled. By adding physics constraints, we tell that joint it can't rotate past a certain degree, preventing that from happening. Also, when I was super close to being done this character, I had a stupid bug occur where my fingers shriveled up into the hand. This was simply because I had exported my mesh with keyframes and it was a simple fix, but it was funny nonetheless. Once all these bugs were ironed out, it was a matter of polish. This meant adjusting my textures to make sure they looked the best they could, adjusting skinning so everything was deforming properly, I'm still not 100% happy with how the wrists perform. I feel like they sometimes look awkward. That's something I can fix in an update for now. I think they're good enough. Now, finally, with the character in Gary's mod, I'm happy to present to you the legally distinct Yogg's Cast Lewis player model. And finally, after 24 minutes, we have drawn to our conclusion. I hope you enjoyed our time spent together on this project breakdown. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. I really am looking forward to making more videos like this. If you want to see funny tweets while I'm working on a project, you can follow me on Twitter at BradyJHardy. I'll be live streaming parts of the process of the next Yogscast player model over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash BradyJHardy. I should mention that I am a Twitch affiliate, and if you really want to support me, please consider subscribing over on Twitch. 
If you want to see me do more Yogg's Cat stuff, please let me know in the comments. For now, I plan on doing Sharky next. I know everyone loves Ben's current player model, but I think making a Sharky more in line with their merchandise would be really cute. I really hope you all enjoy what I created here today, and I hope you will enjoy what I create next. Thank you so much for watching, I hope to see you next time.